Okay. Thank you for coming, ladies and gentlemen. This is VEE 2028 Money and Banking One. My name is Yosuke. It's like yo and uh, you know skiing, so it's easy to remember. <laughs> This is the reference for this module, Greenbaum and Taco are Contemporary Financial Intermediation. You don't have to buy it, but it's a good book if you are very much interested in banking. Yeah, I recommend you take a look at it. But I'll make this module so that, you know, I'll make slides and tutorials and so on so that you don't really have to buy and read this book. There are several announcements. They are important, so please look at them when you, when you have time. This is the syllabus plan. Please take a look at it later. OK, this is the plan for week one. Before starting um, banking-specific issues, I want to start with a more general theme of uh, risk management. After all, banking is mainly about you know, how to manage risks. So it's a very good idea to develop more intuition about how, in general, risk is managed. So we want to do two examples of risk management. First is the risk management by asset portfolio managers. That is based on so-called the mean variance approach. And the second example of the risk management will be that by insurance companies that relies on the law of large numbers. So this week, we are going to study the first example of the risk management by portfolio managers. We'll start with a couple of preliminaries and then move on to portfolio risk management. OK? That's our plan. OK, this is the first building block, the notion of the rate of return, or simply return. I know that you all studied this before, but yeah, this is the first class, so let's do it. OK, think about any asset. It can be company's share or bond or currency or whatever. Let's say today's date t, and the next date is date t plus 1. By the way, I posted this, uh, so yeah. The return on the asset that realizes at date t plus 1 is defined by the right-hand side. The date t plus 1 price dt plus 1 plus the dividends paid at date t plus 1 divided by the current price pt. If you subtract 1, it's called net return. If you don't subtract 1, then it's called gross return. No big deal. The important thing is that the return comes from two things, the capital gain from the price change and the income gain from a dividend payment. Of course, it can be called coupon if it's bond or rent if it's a physical property, but the formula is the same for any kind of asset. In particular, this formula applies to a portfolio of assets as well. A portfolio is just a collection of more than one kind of asset. Here's a very simple example. Let's say you have 100 pounds and you invest 50% of the money in the stock of company A and 25% of your money in company B's stock, and uh, the rest, 25% in company C's stock. By the way, stock is an um, American English for company's share. Okay, Stock and share are the same thing. So this is a very simple example of portfolio. And if you are interested in the return on the portfolio, you can go back to this definition. However, there's another important formula for the portfolio return. The left-hand side, RP, is the return on the portfolio. And the right-hand side, in the right-hand side, RA, RB, RC, are individual returns in stocks A, B, and C. And this formula says that the portfolio return is simply the weighted average of the individual returns, where the weights are the portfolio weights. Let's check that this formula actually holds with a very simple example. Suppose the realized returns for stock ABC, 
were 5 percent, 20 percent, and negative 10 percent respectively. You invest 50 pounds in stock A, the price rose by 5 percent, so at the end of the period, the value of stock A you own is 52.5 pounds. The price of stock B increased by 20 percent, you invested initially 25 pounds, so at the end of the period, the value of stock B you own is 30 pounds. Unfortunately, the price of stock C dropped by 10 percent, so the value of stock C you own is now 22.5 pounds. So, <coughs> at the end of the period, the total value of your portfolio of stocks is 52.5 plus 30 plus 22.5 equal 105 pounds. According to this definition of the return, you initially invested 100 pounds, now it's worth 105 pounds, the return is 5%. Yeah? Let, let's assume that there was no dividend payment during this period. Let's confirm that this return formula also holds. According to this formula, the portfolio return is the weighted average of individual returns. Individual returns are 5%, 20%, minus 10%. Portfolio weights are 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. So that will give you 0 0.05, <laughs> the same as this 5%. Okay? Easy, right? Good. The second building block for today's class is the notion of short selling. Here's the principle of the capital gain. Suppose you expect the price of some asset will soon increase. Uh, actually, there's some uh, seats, so can people sitting on the aisle let these people to sit somewhere? Yes, thank you for your cooperation. Okay. Suppose you expect the price of some asset will soon increase. How can you get capital gain? It's easy. Buy the asset now in the market. Once the price increases, sell it in the market. And after doing that, some cash is left in your hand, and that is your capital gain. You bought it for low price. You sold it for higher price. So the difference is your capital gain. What if you expect the price of some asset will soon drop? How can you get capital gain if you expect price drop? The following is the procedure. If you expect the price drop, borrow the asset from someone and immediately sell it in the market. Once the price actually drops, buy it back from the market and return it to the original owner. This process is called short selling. You sold it before the price dropped, and you bought it back after the price dropped. So after doing that, some cash is left in your hand, and that is your capital gain. So the important thing here is that because investors can sell a thing without actually owning it by borrowing and returning, there is a way to get capital gain even when they expect price drop. Of course, the price may rise against the expectation, so short selling is maybe riskier, but in, in principle, it's possible. In reality, there are some limitations in the regulations for short selling. No one will lend you their asset for free. Probably you have to pay some fee. Also, probably they will ask you to provide some deposit or collateral just in case you fail to return the asset. But in practice, you can do it. OK? Right. The third preliminary, basic high school statistics. I know you all studied statistics before. Yeah, but this is the first class. Let, let us do it. OK, here's the notion of expectation, variance, covariance, co standard deviation, and correlation coefficient of random variables. Let's consider a very simple example 
of only three possible states. Suppose in the future, there are three possible states. Summer is coming, the summer can be really hot, or mild, or cold. We don't know exactly, we don't know which state we realize, but we know the probabilities, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, and 0.2. Suppose you own a beer company, a brewery, and let's say X is the sales of your brewery. If the summer is hot, then the beer sells a lot, and the, uh, the sales will be as high as 9,000 pounds. If the summer turns out very wet and chilly, then uh, People don't buy much beer, so yeah, the sales will be as low as 3,000 pounds. Okay, except you don't know what we'll realize, so X is an example of a random variable. Similarly, suppose you also own an ice cream company, a creamery, and Y is the sales of your creamery. Again, if the summer is hot, then ice cream sells a lot, so the sales is high, as high as 8,000 pounds, okay? <coughs> Refresh your memory. How can you compute the expectation, the expected value of X, the sales of your brewery? Refresh your memory. This is the formula. Expectation of X denoted by E of X is nothing but the weighted average of these possible realizations using these probabilities as weights. That is 0 0.5 times 9,000 pounds plus 0 0.3 times 5,000 pounds plus 0 0.2 times 3,000 pounds equal 6.6 thousand pounds. This is a theoretical average of the performance of your brewery sales. Similarly, if you want to know, oh, by the way, the expectation is also called mean, so the Greek letter mu is also used, but E of x and mu x are the same thing. Similarly, the mean or the expectation of the sales of your creamery business is the weighted average of the realizations using the probabilities as weights, and if you do that, yeah, you'll find that the expectation is 6.6 thousand pounds. I mean, in this example, the, the x and y have the same mean or, or expectation by coincidence, but you know, in general, the mean can be any number. Now, if you look at these two random variables very, very carefully, you will soon notice that your brewery sales, your brewery business is a little riskier than your creamery business. If the summer is hot, then the brewery sales is higher than the creamery sales. But if the summer turns out very cold, then the creamery's brewery sales will be actually lower than that of the creamery. Okay? In this sense, your brewery business, brewery sales, has more variability than your creamery sales. How can we measure such variability or risk of random variables? Refresh your memory. The answer is variance, right? The variance will give you such measure. To compute the variance, first you should compute the deviation from the mean. This column is just these possible realizations minus the mean, so 9 minus 6.6 5 minus 6.6 6 .6 and 3 minus 6.6. .6. Once you compute the deviations from the mean, then square them. So this column is just the square of the previous column. And then take the weighted average of these squared devi deviations using the probabilities as weights. Okay, 0 0.5 times 5.76 thousand pounds squared plus 0 0.3 times, yeah, and so on. So in this example, the variance of your brewery sales is 6.24 thousand pounds squared. Similarly, if you want to compute the variance of your creamery sales, Compute the deviation from the mean, square them, take the weighted average using the probabilities, and you'll see that the variance of your creamery sales is 2.44 thousand pounds. Now you can officially say that the brewery sales is riskier than the creamery sales. The variability is larger because the variance is 
Leiser. Any question? The problem of the variance is that it's not very intuitive. You know, what does this is thousand pounds squared mean? You know, this is the problem of the variance. If the original unit, the unit of the original random variable is, uh, let's say, meter, then the unit of the variance is meter squared. If the original unit is week or month or year, then the unit of the, its variance will be week squared or month squared or year squared. Doesn't make any sense. And the reason is because in the process of computing the variance, we squared everything. Yeah? For this reason, the more intuitive measure of the variability or risk of a random variable is the standard deviation. The standard deviation, which often is denoted by Greek letter sigma, is just the square root of the variance. So the standard deviation of your brewery cells is the square root of 6.24 equal uh, 6.24 thousand pounds squared. Okay? Equal 2.5 thousand pounds. Similarly, standard deviation of your creamery cells is the square root of its variance equal 1.56 thousand pounds. The standard deviation has more intuition about the variability of risk of the, ran of the random variable. What does the standard deviation of the brewery cells being 2.5 thousand pounds mean? It means that the deviation, okay, the actual mean, the theoretical average of your brewery performance is 6.6 thousand pounds, but you know, the actual realization can be much higher than, or lower than its mean. And this standard deviation says that even if the actual realization deviates from the theoretical average by this much, you shouldn't be shocked. You shouldn't be surprised. Okay? The mean plus minus 2.5 thousand pounds is uh, very, yeah, it happens. It's very normal or common or standard or whatever. Okay? That's the intuition of the standard deviation. So far so good? Okay, now let's look at these two random variables more closely. You would notice that these two random variables have a similar fate. If the summer is hot, then both beer and ice cream sell a lot and the sales will be high in both businesses. If the summer turns out very rainy and cold, both businesses will perform very poorly. And in this sense, these two random variables have a similar fate. But of course, you can consider a different situation in which the two random variables tend to move in the opposite direction, so that when one is high, the other is likely to be low. How can we measure such co-movement or a link between two random variables. Yeah, you studied that, right? Covariance. Covariance will give you a measure for that. To compute the covariance, first you should compute the product of the deviation. So this column is just this column times this column, okay? Once you get the product of the deviations, then take the weighted average of these products of uh, deviations using the probabilities as weights. So the covariance between x and y is probability 0.5 times 3.36 thousand pounds squared plus probability 0.3 times 0.96 thousand pounds squared and so on, equal 3.84 thousand pounds squared. Again, the covariance has a similar problem. I mean, it's not very intuitive. You don't know if this is really large or small, right? And for this reason, a popular measure of the degree of co-movement or a link between two random variables is the correlation coefficient. And here is the definition of the correlation coefficient. 
Correlation coefficient is often denoted by Greek letter rho. So rho of x and y is equal to their covariance divided by the standard deviation of x and the standard deviation of y. In this example, the covariance is 3.84,000 pounds squared. The standard deviation is 2.5,000 pounds for x and 1.56,000 pounds for y. So the correlation between them is 0.984. The correlation coefficient is a more intuitive measure of the degree of co-movement between two random variables because the correlation coefficient always falls between 1 and negative 1. If it's close to 1, then it is said that the two random variables have almost perfect positive correlation, meaning that they tend to move in the, opposite dire in the same direction. If one is high, then the other is likely to be high. If the one is low, then the other is likely to be low. If the correlation coefficient is close to negative one, then yeah, it is said that they have almost perfect negative correlation, meaning that they tend to move in the opposite direction. When one is high, the other is likely to be low, or vice versa. Finally, if the correlation coefficient is close to zero, then we say that they have almost no correlation. Most studies, if they have to report the statistics of their data, they report standard deviations and correlation coefficients. They do not report variances or covariances because they are not very intuitive. So if you have to write a term paper or a thesis and if you have to report the statistics of your data, do not report variances or covariances. Just report standard deviations and correlation coefficient. However, if you really need to know the variances and covariances, you can always recover the variances and covariances from the standard deviations and the correlation coefficient. We can go back to the previous slide. If you know the standard deviation and you want to know the variance, just square the standard deviation and you get the variance. If you want to know the covariance, then we can use this equation in the opposite direction. So the covariance will be the correlation coefficient times the two standard deviations. Okay? So in other words, knowing the standard deviations and the correlation coefficient is the same as knowing the variances and the covariance. The information, the amount of information is the same. And therefore, you should report these, not these. OK, we just finished the building blocks for today's class. Is it OK so far? OK, good. OK, so far we had only two random variables, your brewery cells and creamery cells, x and y. But in reality, there can be many more random variables. In the context of portfolio management, random variables are asset returns, which means that there are as many as random variables, as many random variables as uh, the kinds of assets. Yeah? Let's assume that there are five companies' shares in the market which means that there are five returns, five random variables. So there are stocks A, B, C, D, and E. And suppose you are interested in investing your 1,000 pounds in a portfolio of these five companies' assets, I mean stocks. What is the first thing you want to know? The expected returns, the expectations. You can call your portfolio manager and your portfolio manager will tell you the expectation information. The expectation information looks like this. Because there are five companies, there will be five expectations. Aviva, 1.10%, British Gas, 0.9%, Capita, 1.05%, and so on. You might think 1% is very small, but uh, let's say this is a monthly return. So, you know, 1% per month is almost 12% 12, 12 per year. So it's not, it's not that very small. Okay. This is the expectation information. What is the second thing you want to know if you want to invest in a portfolio of these companies? 
the risk information. Yeah? For that, you can also call your portfolio manager. And your portfolio manager will give you the risk information. Now, what does the risk information look like if there are five companies? You might think that, well, the risk information is captured by the variance, right? And there are five random variables, which means that there are five variances. So the risk information should be a vector of five variances. You might think so, but no, that's not, that's not enough. That's part of the risk information, but that's not enough, because you also, you're also interested in yeah, you might think that the uh, risk information looks like this. The variance of Aviva's return is 290% squared, and the variance is 131% squared for British gas. But that's not enough. And the reason is because you are also interested in how Aviva's return and the British gas return are related, how capital's performance and EasyJet's performance are correlated. So, if there are five random variables, the risk information is expressed by a five by five matrix, which is called the variance covariance matrix. In this matrix, the diagonal elements are the variances. 290% squared is the variance of Aviva's return. 131% squared is the variance of British gas's return. Of diagonal elements, are the covariances. For example, 96% squared is the covariance between Aviva and British gas returns. 22 is the covariance between Diageo and the EasyJet. The variance covariance matrix is always symmetric in terms of this diagonal line. You see 96 here and 96 here. You see 53 at this corner and 53 at the other corner as well. And the reason is because, you know, the covariance of x and y is the same as the covariance of y and x. Just merely switching x and y doesn't change the variance. And because of that, the variance-covariance matrix is always symmetric in terms of this diagonal line. Of course, as I said before, Variances and covariances are not very intuitive measures. So if you call your portfolio manager, probably she will tell you standard deviations and correlation coefficients instead of variances and covariances. She will give you a vector of five standard deviations and a matrix composed of correlation coefficients called the correlation matrix. So here, 0.495 is the correlation coefficient between Aviva and British gas. So far so good? Good. Is it okay? Good. Oh, this year's class is really active. I'm glad. Right. OK, we know all these notions, expectations, variances, covariances, correlation coefficients for more than two random variables. OK, we know what the expectation and risk information look like if there are many random variables. Now we are ready to introduce two important formulas, the expectation formula and the variance formula. Let's start with the expectation formula. A linear combination of variables is something like this. 3x1 plus 0.5x2 minus 10 times x3 plus 8x4. It's basically the sum of these variables with some additional coefficients in front of them. It's called linear because there is nothing like x1 squared or log or exponential or anything like that. The next formula tells you What's the expectation of a linear combination of random variables? Yes, in this formula, x is a random variables, but w's are not ra uh, w's are non-random coefficients. So it's like uh, three and 0 0.5 in this example. Okay, and according to this according to this formula, the expectation of a linear combination of n random variables is equal to the linear combination of their expectations. 
for example, the expectation of this particular linear combination is three times the expectation of x1 plus 0.5 times the expectation of x2, and so on. Which means that as long as you have the information about the, in the expectations of the individual random variables, you can compute the expectation of any linear combination of these random variables. We can even simplify this formula by introducing vector notation. Let's say mu is the vector of expectations. So mu1 is the expectation of x1. So mu1 and x2, ex1 are the same. And mu2 is the expectation or mean of the second random variable. So ex, ex2 and mu2 are the same. Okay, so mu is the vector of the expectations. Let's also denote by w the vector of the non-random coefficients. So w1 is 3, and w2 is 0.5 in this example. <coughs> then the right-hand side of this formula is simply mu times w. Here you should remember the matrix algebra, or inner product of two vectors. Mu times w is mu1 times w1 plus mu2 w2 dot 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 mu n w n. This is the expectation formula. Why is it useful? Well, you can apply this to the investment context. In the investment context, these random variables are asset returns, and these coefficients are portfolio weights. So if there are five stocks, the mu, the expect expectation vector, is like this, 1.10% for Aviva, 0.9% for British gas, and so on. And let's say your portfolio, you have some money, and you construct a portfolio of these five company stocks. OK, I mean, I'm going to invest 40% of my money in Aviva, 20% of my money in British gas, another 20% in capital, 15% in Diazo, and the rest in EasyJet. So this is your portfolio weights. And then the left-hand side will be the expectation of your portfolio return, which is equal to the weight the average of individual expectations. So, okay, mu w in this case is equal to 0.4 times 1.1 percent plus 0.2 times 0.9 percent, and so on. Equal 1.0625 percent. That's the expected return on your portfolio. OK, if you know the expectations of individual assets, construct any portfolio, and you can immediately compute the expected return on your portfolio. How about the risk? Suppose you know everything about the risk of individual asset returns, and you construct your own portfolio can you compute the risk of your portfolio return? The answer is yes. But it's a little more complicated than the expectation. So let's do that step by step. The key is the variance formula. You studied this, I think, but yeah, let's do it. The simplest form of the variance formula is this, variance of x plus y is like the total sales of your brewery and creamery businesses, right? The variance of x plus y is equal to the variance of x plus 2 times covariance of x and y plus the variance of y. A lot of a typical mistake that a lot of people make is variance of x plus y is equal to variance of x plus variance of y. Don't forget this covariance. I have a mnemonic for you. When we were high school, we learned this expansion formula. x plus y squared is not just x squared plus y squared. There's a cross term to x, y. This variance formula looks pretty much like this, our familiar expansion formula, especially if you remember the fact that the unit of the variance is the square of the unit of x. Let's practice this formula. Suppose both x and y 
have variance 15, and suppose the covariance is minus 5. Then what is the variance of the, the sum of x and y? Well, 15 plus 2 times minus 5 plus 15 equal 20. OK, we can remember this formula. We can use this formula. But what is the intuition? <laughs> I'm not asking about that. <laughs> I like uh, babies, so I don't <laughs> mind. <laughs> What is the expectation, uh, excuse me, what is the intuition, what is the intuition of this formula? In particular, what is this covariance term? It looks, um, looks ugly. Is it important? To get the intuition of this formula, we should go back to our previous example of your brewery business and creamery business. If you remember, in that example, the two businesses had similar fate. If the summer is hot, both beer and ice cream sell a lot, and the sales will be high. But if the summer is chilly, then both businesses perform very poorly. So in this sense, they, the two businesses, the two sales had similar fate. But you can think of some, a different situation in which the two businesses you own is, the, let's say, the export business and the import business. Yeah? If the British pound appreciates, it's good for import, but bad for exports. The import business does well, but the export business performs very poorly. If the British pound depreciates, it's bad for import, but good for exports. So the export business performs very well, and the import business performs very poorly. In the former example of the brewery and the creamery businesses, it's very likely that this covariance term is positive so that the risk of the total sales of the brewery and the creamery together is actually larger the sum of the brewery risk and the creamery risk because these two businesses have a similar fate. But in the second example of the import and export businesses, this covariance term is likely to be negative so that the total risk, the variability of the sales of the import and export businesses together is actually smaller than the sum of the import business risk and the export business risk because these two businesses offset, partially offset each other's performance. Now you understand that this covariance term is actually the key or essence in the context of uh, risk management. Okay? This is the slightly extended version of the variance formula. Now, random variables x and y have non random coefficients in front of them. Yeah, so if x and y are the same random variables as before, and a and b are both half, then you can compute the variance of half x plus half y. a is 0.5, variance of x is 15, a is 0.5, b is 0.5, the covariance is minus 5, b is 0.5, and the variance of y is 15, so it's going to be 5. And the mnemonic is very similar. Another expansion formula from our high school, ax plus by squared is equal to a squared x squared, plus 2ab times x times y, plus b squared y squared. The special case is when b is 0. When b is 0, this formula reduces to this. Variance of ax equal a squared variance of x. Lots of people forget this is square, but don't forget it. What if we have three random variables? X, Y, and Z. If you have good intuition, maybe you can make a guess. It looks like this. There are three variance terms, variances of X, Y, and Z. <coughs> Excuse me. Both are having their own coefficient in front of them which is now squared, and then there will be three covariance terms. Covariance between x and y, between y and z, and between z and x, all the possible combinations of two random variables. And each covariance has two times 
the product of their own coefficients in front of them. If there are four random variables, the variance of a linear combination of four random variables is very similar. There will be four variance terms, and then there will be six covariance terms. Because if there are four random variables, there will be six possible pairs. The first and second random variables, the first and the third, the first and the fourth, the second and the third, the second and the fourth, and the third and the fourth. Six possible pairs. So there will be six covariance terms if there are four random variables here. In general, This is the general variance formula. If there are n random variables, and it can be 1,000, OK? There will be n variance states, each having their own coefficient now squared, and a bunch of, bunch of covariance states. This summation notation means that you should sum up this expression for all possible pair of i and j, such that i is smaller than j. So if n is 4, yeah, possible i and j will be 1 and 2, 1 and 3, 1 and 4, 2 and 3, 2 and 4, and 3 and 4. So this formula is great. If you have, if you know, the variances and the covariances of all the individual random variables, and you construct a linear combination, and you can immediately compute the variance, the risk, of that linear combination using this formula. The problem is that this formula doesn't look very pretty. It's really hard to remember. But if you use matrix form, if you use matrix notation, this formula turns out to have a very simple expression. So let's do that. We are going to rewrite this important variance formula using vectors and matrix. As a preparation, put all the variances and covariances in a matrix. So put the variances in the diagonal elements and put the covariances in off-diagonal elements. This matrix is called the variance-covariance matrix. You just uh, arrange the variances and covariances. Call it V, OK? Now, once we make the variance covariance matrix, it turns out that this variance of a linear combination of the n random variables has a very simple expression. That is, the vector of the non random coefficients in the form of a row vector times the n by n variance covariance matrix we've just made, times, again, the vector of the coefficients, but now in the form of a column vector. If we denote the vector of the coefficients by w, this variance formula turns out to, be, turns out to have a surprisingly simple form of W transpose times V times W. Surprisingly simple form. <coughs> Surprise. <laughs> OK, let's practice this formula, right? Doing some simple numerical example is always a good idea to absorb a general knowledge. Let's say there are only three random variables x1, x2, x3. And let's say, again, you know everything about these random variables. The variance is, excuse me, variance is uh, 131 for x1, 58 for x2, 83 for x3, 24 for x3. And the covariance, so this one, two element is the covariance between x1 and x2, which is 46. One, three element is the covariance between x1 and x3. And two, three element is the covariance between x2 and x3. Let's consider the variance of this particular linear combination where the coefficients, weights, the w vector is 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.3. Yeah? 
So W prime times V times W. This is the formula. And you know, you have to remember this matrix multiplication. I posted uh, on, on the course, course website, I posted the links to YouTube tutorials on basic matrix uh, calculus. So if you, are not, if you don't remember, then please watch it. If you conduct this calculation, then this variance is equal to 38.84, okay? So if you have, if you know the expectations and variances and covariances of individual asset returns, you can construct, you can customize any favorite portfolio. Portfolio is just portfolio weights. And you can immediately compute the expected return on your portfolio and the risk of your portfolio using these formulas. I think it's a good place to stop, so thank you.